Welcome to Fawcett's uh, Intelligent Corporation Group. I'm really happy to be with two fantastic speakers here today, Kate Siltz, who will be speaking on NFTs for engineering property rights, and uh, David Brin, who will be speaking on surveillance. Uh, first one up, we have a new set of questions on DQE. Um, DQE is a platform that you can that we can basically use to uh, incentivize you to um, submit the uh, answers to questions that we think are of relevance to the group. And uh, the, one of the prompts of the previous round was, what is the most exciting cooperative arrangements that could be unlocked with zero knowledge proofs? And you've answered and a $250 uh, bounty was won for an answer. Uh, and then the next question with a deadline on September 8 is, what would it take to secure civilization's computer infrastructure? And uh, that uh, is uh, based on the chapter that we just released. And so we also released a new chapter. It would be really lovely to have your comments on that. It's on computer security um, as a way to secure uh, a civilization. Um, and so today we will start with David Brin's uh, presentation and uh, to kind of see the context of the presentation on surveillance. Maybe it's good to go uh, back uh, a step to the chapter uh, on um, on existential risks that we published. And um, the, in the chapter, we basically argue that we face a conundrum. We're standing between uh, two kind of quite scary risks. One is the risk of small kills all on the one hand. And that basically means that uh, with technological proliferation um, that will uh, soon lead to scenarios uh, in which a smaller number of people will have the chance to create a, ever larger destruction uh, using technologies such as biotechnology, nanotechnology, even computer insecurities can just be easier exploitable uh, exploited by a, a smaller number of actors in the in the future. That risk we small uh, we call small kills all. Um, and then on the other hand, um, you often um, kind of here the alternative scenario discussed uh, that basically calls for uh, in the face of those uh, te uh, of this technological proliferation we need powerful governments um, that can monitor potentially dangerous activity and can physically intervene in people's lives um, on a really fine-grained scale uh, that is required really to monitor and to uh, and to protect against those risks um, and so this creates a uh, potential existential risk on the other side, uh, which is that of a, a totalitarian um, dictator and a single point of failure, uh, which we call a power suicide. Uh, and so on the long run, you know, we need to kind of create systems that are in between uh, and that can avoid both of those risks. And uh, we um, propose to do this um, with uh, a, a fabric that um, we call multipolar active shield. Um, and that would basically be an encrypted uh, mechanism uh, in which you'd have mutually watching watchers uh, monitor each other's activity uh, and can then uh, also enforce uh, defense uh, when necessary. And we have a lot more uh, on that in the chapter, but uh, it is somewhat taking inspirations from, um, from a, a book by David. Uh, and uh, that book uh, is on transparent society. And he basically here calls for um, a state of surveillance. So uh, surveillance, but uh, from below in which we can make sure that we also watch uh, the watchers. Um, and he goes from the premise that surveillance will already um, be inevitable in, uh, on, on the long term. Uh, on the long term um, uh, because just of the economics uh, of it going down and because of how useful it is uh, to know information of how much uh, people crave uh, people crave for it and we then take it a next uh, step and also suggest that potentially robotic enforcement may be something that we cannot avoid and um, and just because of the economics of it and so uh, we need to make sure that it's secure if we cannot avoid it uh, and so I'm uh, super happy to have David uh, speak on surveillance here. Uh, David, please uh, take it away. Um, all right, I have just 10 minutes, so I'm going to dive right in. I, I, because of this, I am skipping out on the last part of, of the fest trift for um, Roger Penrose on uh, quantum consciousness. So it's highly related, um, very, very interesting stuff. And I'd like to congratulate you uh, Allison and your colleagues on the um, um, intelligent voluntary cooperation uh, manuscript that you're circulating. It's, um, it's quite brilliant. Um, it, it explores the possibilities of positive sum thinking, which is the, uh, the great concept underlying the, uh, all of the enlightenment experiments, uh, the Periclean one that lasted a couple of hundred years, about 500 BCE, the um, Da Vinci's Florence, all of them uh, triggering immune reactions from the surrounding oligarchies. And the parallel that I make is between a pyramid-shaped human culture 
which uh, has an oligarchy at the top whose top priority is to keep everyone down below and take other men's women and wheat. And the sexism is a deliberately accurate part of that um, versus the diamond shaped social structure, which is emphasizes a vastly empowered middle class with merit based individual churn uh, that is unafraid of the rich and outnumbers the poor and is constantly rising. Um, I can talk, I have, uh, email me if you'd like um, links to, to uh, that, uh, where I go into that. Now, Al Allison referred to the Fermi paradox obliquely because of course, one of the great um, filters would be if small kills all, if, we, if everybody out there comes across a technology that um, uh, even the rare exceptions in a society um, could use to destroy the ability of that society be, to become noticeable across the galaxy. Uh, I have spoken of this regularly at um, um, some of our protector castes agencies. There are some of the agencies in our protector caste. This is the first year and six I haven't spoken at CIA who are very concerned and, and who ask science fiction authors to scare them. And we always succeed. Um, but the, the reflexive answer that is given by the Chinese um, uh, court intellectuals is, and you find this all the time, uh, 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 Fang Jiang and, and other uh, court intellectuals rationalize that this is one of the reasons why they must have a centralized pyramidal oligarchic led state, only they call it led by the people, the, the people's vanguard, you know, whatever magical incantations and religious dogmas are used to justify um, a return to the standard um, male uh, reproductive success notion of the pyramidal social structure and the destruction of the periclean alternative. Uh, it happens if you look upon hu across human history, it's absolutely proved that these have one advantage. They are uh, stable, they work with human reproductive patterns, and they have one big disadvantage. They are always stupid incredibly stupid and what you get is the uh, dismal litany that's called history. Uh, and the Periclean um, alternatives are unstable and sometimes topple into stupidity as we saw happen to Periclean Athens, uh, Da Vinci's Florence, but they are so vastly creative that they are able to dance upon um, the future. Now, small kills all, the. The, the answer recommended by Fang Jiang and the other Chinese court intellectuals, uh, and write to me if you want my essay about that, is that you need a centralized control or you're not going to catch these, um, these anomalies that can kill everybody. Um, it, unfortunately, that is answered by the incredible grotesque stupidity of all pyramidal systems. Theirs is smarter than all other pyramidal systems. I'll grant that. They have learned from all the others, including Japan Incorporated from the 1980s that we thought was going to conquer the world, but made mistakes. However, it's still stupid inherently. What you have as an alternative is reciprocal accountability. And so I finally got to what Allison wanted me to talk about. And that is the basic notion that underlies the um, great enlightenment experiment and that amazingly and miraculously most Americans and most Westerners viscerally understand but simply cannot seem to grasp in a way that that recapitulates and that is that 90% um, of our air detection systems are flat and reciprocal. And that is how science works. The scientists are the most competitive humans our species ever made. And that is how science gets forward, not by some declarations from central authorities. And it's true about all of our um, systems. And so one of the things that is uh, touched upon, I haven't read the whole book yet in Allison's book, is the notion that 
um, we have to open up cooperation, but cooperation is joined at the hip, co-joined at the hip with competition. You can't get creative competition without cooperation in the creation of systems that combat cheating. And you can't get proper cooperation among humans unless you have competitive systems that, that uh, dynamically correct errors in real time. So reciprocal ac accountability is inherent in this notion of the self-preventing prophecy. We all share visceral fear of Big Brother, but the main thing to fear about Big Brother is the incredible stupidity of Oceania as portrayed by Orwell. Uh, and, you know, it's one thing if Big Brother governed well, but, but Big Brother uh, uh, governs abysmally. And the great benefit of the Western Enlightenment is not democracy and freedom. Those are tools by which we get the unstupidifying effects of reciprocal accountability. Uh, and uh, how we got this is in my latest book, Vivid, to A Vivid Tomorrows, about how science fiction movies have ingrained um, generations of Americans with suspicion of authority and this notion. Uh, Allison, how many minutes do I have left? Uh, three, three to four. Three or four, okay. Um, so, while we viscerally fear Big Brother, the biggest reason to combat Big Brother and to the biggest answer to Feng Jiang and the other court intellectuals of China is um, that history shows that this method, this pyramidal method is stupid. Transparency, universal transparency, surveillance, answering surveillance with surveillance aimed upward at all elites and having the reflex to strip them naked that is the method by which we can avoid Big Brother. If we do that, and it is the great fear of all the oligarchs around the world who are joined in a, a, a push against the Western Enlightenment as we speak, um, if we do that, we'll have a society that uh, is immune to Big Brother, but we'll have a society that is in danger of the second tier. And that is the one they are building in China with social credit. And that is getting all the people to enforce conformity on each other laterally. In other words, the great innovation of the West of reciprocal accountability can be turned cancerous and turned against us and turned into a tool for enforcing homogeneity. In replacing Big Brother with a 51% majority who openly and honestly vote oppression of the 49%. Uh, that is also to be feared, and it's viscerally behind a lot of the people who reject reciprocal accountability surveillance notions uh, like those I recommend. But there's an answer to that, and the answer to that is cultural. That is that if you have a culture that detects everything and detects all behaviors, but among the worst behaviors that are dissed and disliked and pounced upon is nosiness and judgmentality and gossip, then those who say my ob, mind your own business, will be empowered. And those who say, you're not, you're not conforming, will be pounced upon as bullies. If you have that, and we have that, if you have that, then the secondary level of failure mode ought to be answered. 